know, just as we're doing this, as we're praying, just, um, you know, let, let the Holy Spirit move through right now. And I'm, I'm just going to give a moment as we do this. Uh, if the Holy Spirit has a word, if anyone has a word, if you, you know, if something is moving right now, I just encourage you to um, lift it up in prayer. Father, as we come before you right now, I just give this moment um, because, Lord, my heart just goes out for those that are hurting, those that are in need, um, those, Lord, that, um, that that know, that know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit dwells within them, and yet they struggle, they fight, they are, Lord, just beset upon by things. And right now, I just want to lift up people in the congregation. I want to lift up those that I know that are struggling, Father. Um, it, whether it be from you know from just struggling in their heart, struggling with the flesh, struggling with life, uh, struggling with medical issues, struggling with all these things, I just lift them up to you, Lord. I lift up uh, George and Ross to you. I lift up um, Louise to you. I lift up Maxine to you, Lord. And I, I lift up all these people who are struggling, Father. And I just thank you for the ones that, no matter the struggle, no matter the fight, no matter the heart, that Lord, they just keep coming um, because they want to be around your people. They want to take part in this because you, you did this. Lord, the same things, the same things that happened um, when you began your church are the same things that are happening now. And I just lift that up to you right now, Father. And if there's anyone that has anything, Lord, that you would move upon them right now. And if not, Lord, let us keep silent. We do praise Him. We praise Him in the tabernacle. We praise Him in our life. And we praise Him in every moment. And we thank You, Jesus, right now. We thank You, Jesus. And as You do these things in us, we pray that You would just continue to make Yourself known as we go into this message. That You reveal Yourself in the hearts and the spirits of each and every person here. And do this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm entitled the message today, Partiality. Um, and if you would, turn to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to begin, uh, let's say, verse 34. And, and it's funny um, as we come into this because, the, like I said, I've entitled it Partiality because, you know, he begins by show, you know, saying that, you know, God shows no partiality in all those things. But what's also funny to me as we come into this because a lot of us think of the you know, the Jews as being so closed off from everybody, from, you know, thinking of themselves as the chosen. And technically they were, right? Um, but chosen, not because they were so awesome, but chosen to be an example and for God to bring the salvation of mankind through them. Um, and, and it's kind of funny to me as we look at this because the Greeks were kind of the same way. Um, you know, we say humanity as in all humanity, all people, um, you know, the Greeks didn't even have a word for that. To them, there were Greeks, and then there were barbarians. If you weren't a Greek, you were barbarians, and it came from that because, you know, they said that everybody that didn't speak Greek just spoke gibberish. It was like, bar 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 so they called them barbarians, right? So, but we all kind of do that, too. You know, there's... Most of us, no matter how open-minded we are, there's usually someone or something that we kind of hold at a distance or say they're not quite like us, you know. And sometimes it's even true, but, you know, in a way, it's a way that we kind of make divisions amongst ourselves and we do it. And Peter, when he comes into this, you know, we come into this in verse 34, and we're kind of going to just go verse by verse and look at the verses as we go. We don't have enough time for me to just read the whole thing and go through it because we're going to try and get all the way through verse 48. So let's just go as we go. Look at verse 34 with me. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. So stop right there. The first thing we see is, number one, that he opened his mouth, right? Um, without opening his mouth, we wouldn't have this awesome sermon, right? We wouldn't hear what he has to say. We wouldn't hear the truths that he's going to say. And he begins by saying, in truth. So now he's, he's comprehending what God had given him in that vision earlier. And he's like, man, this is really happening. 
which remember is mind blowing for them, right? Because for for the Jew, it was if you wanted to get saved, you had to become a Jew first, then become a Christian. But now he's seen something different is going on. And it's blowing his mind. But the first thing he had to do was open his mouth. And, I, you know, I've kind of gotten into arguments with people about that, especially bosses. Right. It's funny because, you know, I've worked with people and they would say they were Christians. And when I was a younger Christian, the first thing you, you know, that I did when you said you were a Christian is I'd have to try and prove that you weren't. Right. I'd say, oh, really? Are you a Christian? Right. Do you share with your neighbors? Do you share the gospel with your neighbors? Because if you don't, you're not a Christian. Right. Because I, I did. And, and I would. And my bosses didn't tend to appreciate that. And one tried to one tried to actually play that that little card on me. I think it was was it Augustine or one of those monks who said, you know, um, share the gospel and when necessary, use words. And, and they would say that to me. And I would say, like, yeah, that's pretty stupid. Right. That's not biblical. It's not. You know, the Bible does say we are supposed to live our faith. But, you know, just as a slight example. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? Okay. You, you could mime it, right? You know, but is that going to work? No. You know, you've got to say it. They have to hear it. How shall they hear without a preacher? Who's the preacher? You. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So he had to open his mouth. He had to open his mouth. He had to say these things. And he says, in truth, God shows no partiality. And that's a really neat word in the Greek because the word that he's using there, when he says God shows no partiality, you know, back in the old days when you would approach a king, and you see it in the movies, especially like pharaohs and stuff like that, when everybody would come up and they would bow, you know, and they would scrape. And especially a lot of the Asian emperors tended to be one of those things where nobody could sit above them. You know, if they sat, everybody stood, that kind of thing, right? To show partiality was where you would come up and everybody would be bowed. And if you wanted to show favor to someone, you would go and you would lift their face. It means to lift the face. That's what that word means. So when he says that, he was like, you know, there is nobody who can just look at God. God doesn't, you know, he, you know, you're not saving face before him. He's not showing partiality. He doesn't show a favor. He doesn't walk up to one person and go, oh, okay, you can look at me today, but the rest of you keep your heads down. He doesn't do that. You know, when we approach him, we have to approach him in that idea that none of us is worthy. And we know this, but he he wants to show no partiality and he calls everyone to look at him. Um, and he, you know, Deuteronomy ten seventeen. this is one of the things that he's getting from it. And this is the cool thing that Peter's beginning to realize now is this doesn't just apply to the Jew. In Deuteronomy ten seventeen, he said, the Lord, your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, which covers everybody. You know, that covers everybody. If he's a God of God and the Lord of Lords and he's the one true God, then that means he's the one true God for everyone, not just for the Jew. So when he gives this command in Deuteronomy ten seventeen, he says he shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. And if you go read that, it's actually talking about the law and it's talking about being fair and about equal justice being given to everyone. But in Romans two eleven, Paul took it as to mean literally there is no partiality with God. There is not a single one of us that has earned the right to be before him. You know, even what we see with Cornelius here, that God has shown him favor, that God has seen the things that he has done, the good that he has done, but that didn't earn him any right. God just said, I saw it. He didn't say, you know, come on up, right? You earned it. You're, you got your place. He didn't do that. He was still unsaved. He's not saved. As we come into this and we see what he's saying here, Peter begins to understand that the law was to show the world God's glory through Israel. It's not just, it's, that's not what saves. It's to show that God is needed to save. And it was such a big deal to the Jews that when Peter is going through this, when we hear what he says, when he says, man, I hear in truth God shows, you know, there's no partiality with him. 
it's blowing his mind because in his world, you know, if a Jew married a Gentile in his world, literally they would hold a funeral service for the person. They would hold a funeral service, consider them dead. People would, they would hire mourners, you know. You know, if, if Rather married a Jewish girl, their parents would say, oh, she's done, she's dead, she's gone. Right? That's true. Especially Rather, right? But we come into this, and it's yeah, the whole idea for the Jew to become, you know, even to step on the floor of a Gentile home could make them unclean because they might carry the dirt with them. And what if they go to the temple with that dirt? That's why they would say, kick the dirt off of your feet. Because you don't want to carry that in with you to a holy place. You know, that's the mentality they have. That's what they're thinking when they go through this. And Peter's mind is... Verse 35. He says, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Does that mean Cornelius is accepted, saved? By what he did? No. But Cornelius was authentic in his love for the people. Cornelius was seeking God. And he was doing it in honesty. It was in his heart. He heard the God, the one true God of Israel, and he wanted to know him. And he saw his love for his people, and he wanted to love God's people, and he did. Psalm chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. You know, and, and again, this is all opening up for Peter. It's one of those things where it's like this doesn't just apply to Israel. This applies to everyone. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart? That's who does it. And Cornelius is walking upright when he's speaking the truth in his heart. He's given of everything that he has to God and to to his work and what he wants to do. You know, this isn't work salvation. He's not being saved because of his works. He didn't pay enough into the kitty for God to go. You may come forward now again. Peter's already said he's not showing this guy's face because of it. He's saying this guy is seeking him and God is recognizing it where I as a Jew wouldn't. Isn't that heartbreaking sometimes? Because you and I, I, I can do the same thing. You know, I can judge some people by what I see in them, how they dress, how they behave, the things they listen to or watch. And I might judge them and kind of not minister to them because, you know, I don't want to be involved with it. Whereas God sees what they're doing through their heart and he loves them. And he realizes he knows the heart of a person and I don't. You know, am I missing the trust that people are trying to show in God and the people that are trying to seek him because of some of my own religiosity? You know, I want to have standards. I want to be righteous in them. I want to have truth and I don't want to I don't want to bend on those. But I've also got to be careful about using them to keep people out of the kingdom. I've got to be careful. Because the acceptance that we're going to see here is built on Christ. You know, when God truly accepts someone, there's a huge difference here between God accepting the sacrifice and the the giving of Cornelius and recognizing him for it, than saying, okay, that saved you. He doesn't say that. To save, to be saved, because if that was the case, why is Peter here if Cornelius is already saved? Just to kind of put, you know, put ink on the paper to sign the deal. That's not what's going on here. When you and I are accepted by him, truly accepted, no matter how you dress, no matter who you are, whether you like square toe or pointy toe cowboy boots, right? No matter any of that, you're accepted in him because of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter one, verse six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. You and I, when we come to him, it doesn't matter our background or where we came from or any religion we may have experienced or shared. It's him. And when Peter is talking about this, he's like, it doesn't matter whether this guy, you know, whether he has been um, circumcised. You know, 
Peter understands now it's not about that outward appearance or the, you know, the religious acts that we do that gets him to it. Look at verse 36. You know, he goes, you know, he, he says, you know, in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word, he says, which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. Truly, that becomes truth in his mind as he's saying this. And then he tells these Gentiles, these people sitting around, and maybe he's preaching to the six that came with him too, right? Because he says, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached. You know, he says, which John preached. So he's pointing out that the baptism that John preached was one of repentance from sin. It was repenting of sin. And he says, verse 38, how God appointed or anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And it's every time I read that, for some reason, I get that that old adage that we say a lot, you know, know Jesus, know peace, you know, to know Jesus is to know peace. You know, he went around saying these things and doing these things. The word that he says there, you know, when he says that word that, you know, the word which God sent, the word is that logos. It's that same thing in John chapter one, verse one. Okay, the word that was sent was not just what Christ said, but Christ himself. Christ preached that word preaches evangelion. Okay, it means to proclaim good news. That's something that you and I can do. It's the same thing Peter's doing here. You know, we don't have to give an in-depth Bible study. We don't have to, you know, get, you know, everything right. We just have, but you got to open your mouth and you got to say it. You know? I, I cannot, you know, I, you know, my telepathy has failed every time I've tried it. You know? Because sandwiches and drinks are not always just coming out to me when I'm on the couch. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying, you know. I'm getting looks. I need to be careful. But the good news that he preached, the things that he did, the way that he lived and shared. Um, Taylor actually shared this section of scriptures at at U-Turn Friday, which was a great time, man. I encourage you guys, you know, come to U-Turn. Even if you just need a break from something or um, need a shot of scripture in your head, it's, it's a good place to come and, You know, you hear people's hearts, and you hear what God's doing in the hearts of people. Um, But he shared from John chapter 8, verses 32 through 36. And you can all, you know, because what we read in here, is this actually like a a script of what Peter gave? Or did Peter actually talk about what Christ taught? You know, we don't know that. Because like we talked about, you know, they're... They had to keep everything kind of short. They didn't repeat a lot of things when they would write these, these books, like the book of Acts. All right. They were really more like letters because the, you know, the, the paper and everything else, whether they were producing papyrus or whether they were using scrolls were expensive. And, you know, a lot of people didn't know how to write. So here as he's coming into this, you know, is does Peter share something like this? John chapter eight, verse thirty two. Where Jesus is talking to everyone and he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the Pharisees and those, and even the Jews just standing around, you know, because you got to think Peter's one of these guys. He's one of the disciples, and he's going, yeah, yeah, what? Free? What do you mean? And then Jesus says, you know, the other guys are like, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How you can, how can you say you will be made free, right? And that's their mentality. You know, we might be under Roman rule, but... You know, you could tell me what to do, but inside I'm not doing it, all right? You know, because I'm a Jew. I'm chosen by God. Mm, you could beat me. You could kill me. But, I'm, you know, it's that attitude, right? Like your kids, right? <laughs> you know, you want them. You go obey. Do this. Have a good attitude about it. And they do it, you know? And, and that's that whole thing. And these guys are like, We've never been, you know, I ain't never been nobody's slave, nobody's bondage, you right? And then Jesus goes, you know, he says, most assuredly, he says, I'm telling you now, this is the truth. I say to you, 
whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And each and every one of us, and he doesn't say whatever Jew, whatever Greek, you know, whatever Italian, whatever Hispanic, whatever Spanish person, whatever Mexican, whatever Indian, whatever Native American, however you want to coin the phrase. He doesn't say any of that. He says, whoever commits a sin, have you sinned? Then you were in bondage. But I only uh, did that one thing. Yeah, you're in bondage. You are a slave to it. And he says, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So you can turn back to Acts now. So does Peter share that? Does Peter share that? Does he say, you know, here's the things that Jesus Christ said and he did. You know, the teaching that Jesus went around doing, the truth that he shared, which blew everybody's mind. You know, even the Greek speakers and the Greek people were beginning to come because they were seeing what Jesus was doing and knowing that this was not a human being, that this was something different. Because when he says he is Lord of all, the fact that he came and he did what he did tells us that this is who he is. That we are all equally lost and equally in need because he who sins is a slave to it. Isaiah 64, 6, we are, we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Every single one of us. And some of our sins sound really good and really nice and they're really culturally even acceptable. But it's still sin. But in that same breath, in that same thing that makes us all equal before God, the reason that he is Lord of all is because he is Lord of all. Hosea 2.23, you know, he's saying, he says, I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I have mercy on her who have not obtained mercy. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are you are my God. You know, those who are not my people will say, you know, he'll be my people. He is Lord of all. And there's nothing that we can do to deny that, guys. You know, we can respect the religion of other people. Paul, you know, did as much as the same thing when he would go and preach. But he would also teach truth. He wouldn't attack their religion as much as say, oh, that's nice, but there really is just one true God. I don't need to attack them. I just need to present truth. And he will sort it out. As Spurgeon often said, one does not need to defend a lion. He just needs to set him free. You know, if I speak the truth of the word of God, he can defend himself. No doubt, as they come into here and he says, he was healing the oppressed of the devil. How many times, you know, did Peter share? Could you imagine when you and I are there, you know, even if we can look back at the, you know, is there an eternal DVR where we're going to be able to watch all this? Okay, I just want to skip to the parts I really wanted to see in Scripture, right? Are we going to be able to do that? I don't know. But imagine if you could sit down and just talk to Peter. When he talked about, you know, I, I remember coming down from the hill. Such an awesome thing, man. It was such a beautiful thing, you know. And then here were all the disciples, and they were they were praying over this this kid who was possessed by a demon, right? His dad said he keeps throwing himself into the fire. Your disciples been praying for like hours and nothing, right? And then Jesus came up, man, and he, and he just, like that. That demon came out. You know, what if Peter were to share with you when they pulled up in the boat, right? And he said, man, this guy, and he was cutting himself. And this guy was like running around naked in this, in this, you know, in, in this cemetery. And he was eating garbage and filth. And everybody had rejected him and turned away from him. Didn't want anything to do with him. And then Jesus with a word. Flipped the script. This guy instantly changed. 
Can you imagine hearing that from Peter, what he's talking to these people about? And he's sharing when he was, you know, he didn't just heal the oppressed of the devil. He changed their lives forever. Not in just in that moment, but for eternity. Did Peter tell them what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The devil promises us things. He gives us these momentary pleasures. Sometimes, you know, it, it, it's something that we haven't experienced before and it becomes a thing that we want and we want and we want. We have to understand that way leads to death. You know, he does not give it to you to give you pleasure. He gives it to you to trap you and to bind you to him. He who commits sin is a slave to sin. No doubt, you know, Philip in this in the in, in the synagogue there, Philip has shared these teachings of Jesus. No doubt many of the disciples that came from Jerusalem have shared there, right? Have they heard these teachings? Does Peter just kind of cement in it for them? Verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. So he says him, God, God himself raised him up and he showed him openly. That word showed him openly means to display without doubt. He made it clear that this was Jesus Christ risen from the dead. But he says not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So when Peter talks, is he talking about the royal we? Is he talking about us apostles and disciples? You know, we, we were there, guys. Or is he saying it because of the six that are with him? Is he saying we? We were witnesses of this. But here's the thing. Even if they weren't there, they're now witnesses. Why? Because they experienced that infilling of the Holy Spirit. They have experienced that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And by coming to know God dwelling within them, he now, I'm a witness now. Right? Why? Because it happened to me. And I can tell you, man, I'm not the most perfect person. You know, I could be an idiot. Well, a lot of times I was going to say sometimes, but probably more often than not. And I can make a lot of mistakes. But he lives in me. And I can tell you that beyond the shadow of a beyond the shadow of a doubt, I know I'm already in eternity. You know, I want you guys to understand that. You know, if you don't know that, you know that, you know, you better find it out. Because if you can't testify in your heart that Jesus Christ dwells there, you may not know him. How can you say that you have met God? You can't say you've met an eternal being and then just go, eh, no biggie, no whoop, all right? That's not the way it works. You're either saved or you are not. And here he says we are witnesses. We know him, guys. And these six guys, he, he's, we're witnesses. You can talk to these guys. They know he's alive. He's indwelling each and every one of us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said to everyone there, and he says it to us too, you will shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. It's not just the apostles, it's you. But you've got to open your mouth. A lot of times we don't want to open our mouth because we feel like we don't know really what we're talking about. But you do, man. I can tell you about my wife. I know her. I have a relationship with her. I can tell you she doesn't like flowers. She likes blue bonnets. She likes Indian paint brushes. But she doesn't want me to give her flowers. You know? She would rather have a picture of her grandbabies or she would rather have me cook dinner or wash clothes or 
You know, that's what she wants from me. What do I know about my Lord, my God? You can tell people about Jesus, about your relationship with him. You can say, I don't know everything. You know, I don't know what he thinks about this or about that all the time. But we can look at it in his word if you want to. But what I do know is that he loves me. And he died for my sins. And he rose again from the dead. I can tell people that. I can open my mouth and say it. Because he lives in me. It says that he was killed by hanging on a tree. And we know that refers to Deuteronomy where it says, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. But, you know, what's funny is there are some cults that actually use this to say there was no crucifix, no cross. They actually say that and they turn it into this big, huge deal trying to tear down Christianity as it is because we have the cross, right? You know, and you guys know the logo. You know, these are the three nails, okay? And this is the cross. This with this is an anchor. And then just this bottom part represents the Holy Spirit. That's the dove, Okay? And you can see it in the logo. It's there on your bulletins. So they say there is no cross. They turn it into a huge deal. But the idea that it says cross over and over again in the scripture, and they're saying, well, he says tree. Does a tree not have branches? You know? It doesn't mean that he was hung on a pole. It simply is a Hebrew idiom, which means he was cursed. And he was cursed for our sake. We know this. And, you know, the Romans, they wanted to display their victims in the most gruesome and horrible fashion that they could. For them to have them splayed out like that was humiliating. It was degrading, and they wanted to do this. And also, if it hung overhead like this, it didn't suffocate you as fast as it would like this. It would take longer to die like this. And they wanted it to be agonizing, long slow that's where the word you know that's that's where the word excruciating came from was that cruciatus which is agonizing but they he says they right he says they hung him on a tree you know he's not saying that because he's with the romans Because he doesn't say before when he actually was preaching back in Acts chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, he tells the Jews, right? He says, you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. So to the Jews, he said, you did it. But here in this Roman crowd, he doesn't say the Jews did it. He just said they. Why? Because they're implicated in it too. It was the Romans that hung him on the cross. You and I, we know, we know the truth of it, and it was our sin that hung him on that cross. But Peter is consistent in what he's doing here. He's not just trying to be sensitive. The thing that he's getting to, though, it just doesn't end with the cross. Because he goes and he says, raised up on the third day and showed openly. And man, this is like the biggest thing because for many of these people, that's huge. Even nowadays, you know, there are entire branches of the Christian church that are beginning to say that Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, which is the crux of the Christian faith. And there are many, you know, and I'm not going to name all of them, but there are some who actually have begun this in the modern church today. They say to be a Christian is to simply try and live the things that Jesus taught and no more. To live as a community of faith, they call it. It all becomes about the person in the community. And if you want that, go join a club. If you want Christianity, man, you have to understand it hinges on the crucifixion and the resurrection from the dead. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then I will tell you. And I will entreat you to believe it because if you don't, you're not saved, period. And you will go to hell if you deny the fact that he rose from the dead, period. There's going to be a lot of great people in hell. There's going to be some really nice people in hell. There's going to be some really good people that have done good things in hell. Had Cornelius and his friends not come to Christ, which we're going to see here, all the good that he did, he would go to hell, period. 
Why? Because they would deny the only thing that could save them. Here it comes into it, and the crux is the resurrection is difficult for the non-believer. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, he said the Jews want a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Everybody wants philosophy. The Jews want miracles. The Greeks want to hear philosophy. They want to hear these great things and these wise things. And Paul says, we preach Christ, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he's saying here, because whenever he talks about the crucifixion, he also means the resurrection. To raise from the dead. Because it's idiocy to most people for us to say that he had to be put on a cross for our sins. You and I have to understand when he is saying this, they want him, they want these guys to understand in the Greek when he's saying here that he was it was appointed. He's saying that listen, this is clearly made. It is so that Christ was clearly identified in this. Okay? As you look at it, he says, you know. Him, God raised up on the third day, showed him openly. It just says clearly identified. And when he goes and he says, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen by God, those that ate and drank with him. So these are people that are specifically set aside so that they would know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was risen from the dead. We know from 1 Corinthians and from other scriptures that there was over 500 people that saw him alive. But we also know that the disciples the apostles as they were spent the majority of time with him one of the reasons he points out that he ate and drank is because spirits don't have guts they don't have mouths they don't eat so he makes a point to them that you know he wasn't just a ghost he, he wouldn't just float in and go "Ooh, i'm here to teach you the truth you know that kind of stuff right he was like no he had dinner with us in acts chapter 1 verse 3 it says that he was with them for 40 days. How many dinners is that? How many lunches? Could you imagine? You know, if you'd have seen that, you knew he was crucified. He was, he was dead for three days, you know, and you're eating lunch with Jesus. Did he chew with his mouth open? Right? You know, I mean, you, you know, when you're if you're if you went to like, say you went to lunch, you know, who's your you know, we talked about this. And I know I use this as an illustration all the time. If you went to lunch with somebody that was famous. And they. And they chewed like that when you tell everybody, you know, I, I went to lunch with Harrison Ford. He eats with his mouth open, you know, and he talks with his mouth full and sprays food. It was crazy. You would rem you'd memorize every detail of it. And can you imagine when these guys would eat with Jesus and, and Peter's telling them, he's like, man, I, you know, he's real. I had dinner with him for 40 days. He talked to us about how we were supposed to share and do stuff with people. And he ate dinner. Did he burp? You know, I, I think about weird stuff like that because he's real. You know, did he try to grab the last piece of fish before somebody else did? Or did he give it away? Right. Or did he just make another one, right? I don't know what he did. Because he's Jesus, and I ate dinner with him, and he was risen from the dead, and man, he's real, guys. But the thing is, is that testimony of the Holy Spirit in you where you know he's real right now. He's still alive. He's praying for me. He's praying for you. But is he real to you? You know, he's very specific in pertaining to this. You know, you understand now why each and every one of these guys is willing not just to die to themselves, but to literally die. Most of us don't want to die to, you know, man, here you go. Most of us, you know, would, wouldn't be willing to give up our Dallas Cowboys for him. Not saying you got to, okay, but what if he asked you to? Would you? I'm not looking at you, Rather. I'm looking at Tomas. Okay, <laughs> but but it, it kind of goes with that. It kind of goes with that. Most of these guys, you know, again, just like Peter's sitting here, his whole life has been tied into being a Jew, and now God's saying, "Yeah, act like it never happened, right?" 
share the gospel with them. Don't worry about circumcision and all that extra stuff. And Peter's like, oh, oh, okay. And he shares with them, just like he did at Pentecost. Just like he did. So he has to die to himself when he's doing this. But that's why we see these guys, they were so willing to die to themselves and then willing to die literally for the gospel. We read in Acts where it's like when they took a beating, they were like, "Woo, we got whooped for the gospel, right? What an awesome day. Most of us, if we got whipped for the gospel, we'd go home and go, I don't think God's with me. I got beat up, you know, <laughs> where they were like, yeah, God's in the hizzy. Let's go, right? But, you know, guys, we go into this and we have to understand that he's real. He's still alive. And then Peter goes on, verse 42. He commanded us to preach to the people, to testify, to testify. That's like being a witness in, in court. You know, I was an eyewitness to this. I saw this happen to testify that it is he who, were, who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. Period. Period. So preach and testify. That's pretty much what Peter is doing right now. He is preaching and he is testifying about the truth of Christ, who he is in the word, testifying to his walk with him, you know, telling him some of the things just like when you talk to people and you go, I had this happen to me when I was X years old, or I had this happen to me and God brought me through. You know, I struggled with this sin or that sin and God brought me through. It's a testimony in our lives that God is real and still acting in us. But if you don't open your mouth, people won't know. We've got to talk to them. We've got to talk to them. We've got to be real about it. We have to understand that he's ordained by God, which means that he was set. He was appointed by him. That's his thing. That's what he does. And it says to be the judge of the living. And we know from the book of John that his very existence judges us. There is no salvation without him. The very fact that Jesus Christ had to come tells us that we need to be saved. In John chapter 5, verse 30, he says, The judgment of this world is from God himself. His coming is the will of the Father. And so many of these things are evident in it. He's the judge of the dead. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 through 11, Paul says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, and, and listen to what he calls it, the terror of the Lord. It's terror, guys. You know, it's easy for us to ignore sometimes or easy for us to kind of glaze over it. But over and over and over again, the Psalms, right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If God is real, God is going to make things happen in this world, in this life, and what we are that will blow our minds. That each one may receive. That each one may receive. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your consciences, he says. You know. We tried to do everything that was right. You know we told the truth and tried to warn everybody that you need to understand that we are not going to be judged. We, you know, If you are judged on your own merits, if everybody expects to go before God and say, well, I hope my good outweighs my bad, it's not going to work out for you. It's going to go horribly, horribly wrong. He says it's the terror of the Lord because you're... You know, what he's going to do is he's going to say, okay, well, let's see all the good you did. Let's see all the bad you did. Now I'm going to lift up Jesus Christ. You're not even close. Goodbye. And there are going to be some really awesome people going to hell. Some beautiful grandmas. Some precious aunts. Some really great uncles, dads, moms, brothers, sisters. 
Without Christ, there is no guarantee. Without Him, there is nothing. That's why He says, we persuade men. I want to do everything I can to let you know that He is real and He will judge the living and the dead. He judges the living. Even though He said, I didn't come to judge, the very fact of His existence does it. In John chapter 3, verse 17, right? And this is the judgment. You know, he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the only Son of God. It is not how we live that gets us to heaven. We live as we should because of heaven. It is not how we live that gets us to heaven. It is who we trust and believe. Peter says all the scriptures tell of him through his name. You know, all of the scriptures talk that through him comes all this. And I'm not even going to read all these. I'll just kind of name these off. Isaiah 42.1, Isaiah 53.11, Isaiah 61.1, Jeremiah 31.34, Daniel 9.24, Hosea 6.1 through 3, Micah 7.18, Zechariah 13.1, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, just to name a few that talk about the coming of Jesus Christ and the necessity of Him for salvation. The prophets said it. You and I have studied together Genesis chapter 1. We know it. There's no excuse or doubt for anyone, slave or free, Jew or Greek, to reject Him. What does it mean to believe? I signed a card when I was seven. I was saved when I was seven because I signed a card. I lived like a demon for the rest of the time, but boy, I did that. Is that belief? We've talked about this, man. That belief is that trust in, rely on, you know, to lean on him. Belief is not a mental acknowledgement or assent. It means to trust. The scripture, Galatians 3.22 says, Scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You are in sin. And if you don't understand that, if you don't know that, if you don't believe in Him and trust in Him, you're lost. You know? We don't sign a card and it makes everything okay. That's not how it works. Do I believe in Him? And does it change me? me our faith is not how we live i don't change the way i live you know so that i might look more like a christian i can't help it because my nature has now changed and when i'm dumb when i do those bad things when i fight with that old man that's exactly what i'm doing here our faith is not how we live our faith is we live what is going on in us it is displayed you know in our works But we are not saved by those works. For somebody to say they believe in Jesus Christ and then just just keep living like like the world is wrong, period. To truly trust and believe in Jesus Christ is to jump off the cliff. It really is because I'm believing, I'm, I'm looking at that cliff that is eternity and saying, all right, he said he's got me, right? And I'm going to step off into it. But do we? Do I? Because he says here an amazing thing. Again, it's not a religious act. There's no religious act I can do. You know, it's not a contract that gets signed. Okay, he said if I believe in him. Okay, I believe. Am I now saved? Do I believe? Because of what he does here, what he does here, and, and you know, we talked about it, and he's going to talk about it again in Acts thirteen thirty nine. He says, "By him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you you know you could not be justified by the law of Moses." It's not a legal action, but yet it is. It is the covenant written in His blood. To be justified, the Bible says, it's that same thing, man. It's like the easiest thing to remember when you say, what does it mean to be justified? It's just as if I'd never sinned. That's what it means to be justified. 
to understand that he who sins is a slave to sin. I don't want to be a slave to sin. And if he has made me justified, then I don't have to live like that anymore. That is slavery. That is bondage. And I want to move away from that. That's repentance. That's what Cornelius has already begun. He's repented. He's turned away from the life that he lived. He's now beginning to pray, to fast. He's seeking God. And God says, I heard you. I heard your prayers and I answered. And I sent a representative of the gospel to you. He could have just had the angel give it, right? No, because the angel hasn't experienced salvation. He doesn't know what it means to be saved. But Peter does. And he has come and he has said to through faith in Jesus Christ, there is remission, is a receiving of remission of sin in that. Because God, you know, he died for the whole world, did he not? John chapter 3, verse 16, right? All right, do we need to say it together? Because most of you are already saying it in your heads, right? Aren't you? You know, or you're seeing somebody with a sign at a football stadium, you know, for you fans. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He so loved the world. He so loved the world, but he says, he he uses a key word here. He says, receive. You have to receive it. And how do you do that? Through faith. Through belief. Through a committing. Through an act. Does that mean you work to be saved? No, it doesn't mean that. Because I'm not trusting in my belief to save me. I'm trusting in Him. That's what He's calling you to do. To believe in Him is to experience a change. Because it has to happen. Because the Bible says you die. You die to this world. And you are born again. We hear in John chapter In John chapter 6, verses 28 through 29, they're asking him, what works can we do to do works of God? What are the works of God, Jesus? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. It's just simple. That you believe in him whom he has sent. Do you want to work for your salvation? There you go. Do you want to earn it? There you go. Believe in on him who he sent. How do I do that? You believe in him. You believe that he did it all. You believe that you can't earn it. You believe that it is freely given. And freely you must receive. Do you receive it? When Peter is still speaking these words, verse 34, this is what belief looks like, man. You know, does that mean you all need to be speaking in tongues? No, let's just read. Peter was still speaking these words. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard The word, because the moment that Peter said, believe, do you believe? Everybody believed. They didn't get baptized. They didn't get circumcised. They didn't get any eyes. They believed. Those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As I heard Rather say this morning, that word actually means beside oneself. Astonished as many, you know, it's not a nice word. It's a, you know, this is ridiculous. I can't believe God's doing this. This is crazy. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on these Gentiles, these dogs, and the Holy Spirit's on them. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They praised God with their tongue in a language that they had not been taught. Peter answered, can anyone, and who's he talking to here? He's talking to those six circumcised guys, right? Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have now? Could you? He says to them. You just saw God accept them. What are you going to do? can only imagine they were sitting there looking at him going you know (laughs) because look what he says and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the lord and they asked him stay a few days 
right? Yeah, you'd want to, right? Tell me more about this Jesus. Because now he's in me. And I want to know everything I can about him. But look what he says. He says, you know, he, 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 he says, Peter's not astonished. He's not flabbergasted, right? He's not, woo. He's like, oh, yeah. Hey, you guys. And he says he commanded them. Who do you have baptized these guys? The six circumcised Jews. So these guys who are astonished that the Holy Spirit has fallen on them are now going, oh, my. And they're baptizing these guys that they don't even want to touch. And they're just like breaking their hearts every time. Because later we're going to see in chapter 11, the church back in Jerusalem, Peter gets in trouble. He gets called on the carpet for this. They don't get him because of the gospel. But because he went into a Gentile home and had dinner with them. And then he blows everybody's doors off. And guess who his witnesses are? Six of the circumcised. Six circumcised Jews. Those of the circumcision. It's awesome. Now, in closing, as we come into this and, and, and in doing this, you know, a lot of people turn this into the fact that they say that this is indicative that you and I, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we should be speaking in tongues and magnifying God. I get it with the magnifying God because, again, as I've shared with you with my salvation experience, when I got saved, I did speak in tongues. But like I told you, I was at the, I was not in a church where somebody was going, you know, just repeat after me, Mama Bada Honda, Mama Bada Honda, right? It, 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 that's not what it was. It wasn't somebody, you know, telling me to just start moving your lips and see what God does, right? Somebody had shared the gospel with me that day, and I went home. And I was looking at my kids, sleeping in bed. And I just remembering the gospel. Would I let one of my kids die for someone that hated me? I hated God. You know, or thought he was something that, you know, wasn't really, I, I, you know, all of his people on TV ruined God for me. And when I looked at my kids and I realized how much he gave for me that, you know, and that kid that I, would I give him up? What if my kid were willing to give himself up to die? And then, I, you know, that and that turned into that gospel message that just began preaching in my head. And then when I gave my life to him, when I realized he was true and I believed in him, and I said, there is nothing I can do to save myself. Save me. And he said, I, I got you. And then I spake in tongues at the foot of my kid's bed and then walked into the next room and was speaking in tongues. And then the next thing I knew, I was just praising and magnifying God. Did I need to speak in tongues? No, I, I believe he really did that for me because I was used to manipulating. I was used to being manipulated. And he did that for me to testify to my heart, you are saved. It doesn't make me some holier than anybody else. It doesn't mean I'm special. It meant I was so weak in my mind and in my heart that he, I needed that. But I, think, I, I honestly believe that there is something that should be indicative of when we become saved. What should be consistent is, man, you better praise and magnify God because you just experienced a truth that will carry you through eternity. Something that will change, that change you at that moment into a, a new creature. You're no longer just a human being. And they didn't have to be baptized to be saved. Not at all. <laughs> so when somebody tells you, you know, oh, this is a special circumstance. No, it's not. Shut up. These guys were saved. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. He does not fill vessels that he has not made clean. And these people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And even the guys of the circumcision obeyed what Christ was doing at that moment. And they baptized these men. And Peter stayed and he ministered to these people and he gave up whatever time, whatever plans he had to do what God had in store for him. And man, this is amazing to me. And this is a reminder to me as we go into this that you and I, we serve an amazing God. Let's not limit him into how he's going to work with us and in us. Some of you guys, I've seen you begin to take steps of faith that are amazing and beautiful and keep doing it keep doing it 
you know. A lot of these guys with Peter, he's walking a lot. He's doing a lot. And he may think that, what is God really doing? What is he using me for here? What is going on? But right around the corner, there was this experience in Caesarea. And you may be, you know, you may even feel like, oh, you know, you know, in my marriage, in my life. And, you know, and marriage is a ministry. Ask anybody that's married. It's a ministry because it's work, right? But so is being single. So is being any of these things. God has your Pentecost. God has your Caesarea. God has your Joppa. God has your, he has something in store for you. Be patient. Let's see what's around that next corner, okay? Let's pray. Father, we come to you now. We thank you so much, Lord, for uh, for, for your word, uh, the truth of the testimony of this. Um, Father, and for us, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be on us, that we, Lord, would be willing to walk in you, and to be willing, Father, to truly move in a way that is guided by you. And I pray for anyone here, Lord, as they go through this, that they would share that gospel, that they would reach out with that gospel, that they would tell the truth of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, that there are so many evidences for him in the Scripture, that the Scripture testifies of him. Uh, Lord, that the truth is, is he died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. And this is that essential truth that we're lost, that we are all under sin, and we need a Savior, and he is it. And we thank you, Lord, that you have saved us, um, not because of any ritual act that we have done, not because of the rite of baptism or the sacrament of the communion, but because you died for our sins and rose again from the dead. And we trust that that was all it took to save us. And help us, Lord, to walk in our faith, to walk in the truth. Um, Lord, you call us to walk as children of light, so help us to walk like that. Help us to encourage one another in it and help us to realize the truth that we are yours and not our own. And that we, when the Son sets free, is free indeed. And help us to walk like that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please rise with me. One of my favorite parts. Not just because we're over and lunch is on the way, right? But because this is a this is another community thing with us, you know. This is that part where I am. I love the community of this. I love that we're singing scripture. I love that again that connection that it brings us back to, you know, this is, you know, the roots of our Jewish faith, as it were, you know, which is He's the Lord of all. But this is a root, man. They sang this too. Jesus would have sung this as a boy. And it's awesome to me that we're connected like that. Let's do this.